Yo, 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 what is up, student pilots? <laughs> My name is Nick, founder and creator of Part Time Pilot and the host of the Audio Ground School podcast. I'm in a good mood today. It's almost spring. It's what? This is dropping on March 6th. And yeah, so I, I had something really, really cool happen to me the other day. Shout out to to this person if they are listening. But I had someone actually for the first time recognize me from my videos on YouTube and social media. And it was kind of a cool moment. They were like, wait, I was just watching your video with this guy. And he was like, hey, dude, like, <laughs> come over here. It's this guy. We were just watching this video. And so it was really a uh, surreal, unique moment. Kind of cool to uh, be recognized. And then another thing that happened is I saw um, people talking about part-time pilot in a Facebook group for, for student pilots. And usually when people talk about part-time pilot, it's because I have to I have to initiate the conversation like, hey, have you heard of part-time pilot? So people are starting to know about part-time pilot. It's starting to spread out there. We're starting to get recognized. That's what's so cool. We've done all this. We have all this great content and free content and stuff, things to help student pilots out, but no one really knows about us. And there's some things I can do. You know, I can do ads on Facebook and Google and all that stuff, but it really just takes time for word of mouth to spread and, and people to trust us and stuff like that. So it's starting to happen. And that is really, really cool. So thank you guys. If you're a part of that which you are because you're listening right here so i really appreciate that the other thing that i'm really excited about is when i it's march and when i think of march i think of march madness and i am a if you don't know what march madness is it's the college basketball tournament it's one of my favorite times of year i grew up playing basketball basketball was my entire life before you know now pilot and aviation is pretty much my life it was basketball and i actually fun fact about me i got a scholarship to play division two basketball and did that for a couple years before going to the University of Washington and, and and doing aerospace engineering. But yeah, so I'm a big, huge basketball fan. So I'm really excited about that and March Madness. I usually you know go to Vegas with some friends and put a few dollars on some games and watch the games on the big screens and all that stuff. So it's a really fun time. And so if you also are into March Madness, let me know. Let me know who you think is going to win it this year. I, I need some tips for my bracket. So Anywho, without further ado, let's get to today's episode. This is episode number 32. As I said, it's March 6th, 2023. And last episode, we finished up the stuff on airspaces. So we're inside the online ground school. We're in course labeled step two online ground school lessons. And so in that course, we have multiple sections of the online ground school and then in the sections we have lessons but we're on section six on national airspace system and we finished all the stuff on airspace with an airspace review we talked about some mnemonic devices and we did some quiz questions on that so pretty good and there's a link in the show notes to, to an awesome video and memory that i use to finally memorize that stuff so if you haven't checked that out go check that out but today there's one more lesson in section six on national airspace system and that's on transponder requirements it's kind of i i used to have this in the when we talked about transponders and the equipment in the, the first kind of section of the course, which we, we've already covered, you can go listen to those episodes, but it didn't make sense because it was talking about airspaces and students were like, well, what the hell are air, airspaces? So I decided to kind of divide it up. I talked about, you know, how a transponder works and the dials and what it does and all that. And then for the requirements of it, because it has so much to do with your vicinity to an airspace or whether you're in an airspace, I, I threw that in here at the end because I think it makes more sense. So we're going to do that lesson and then we'll probably start the fundamentals of aerodynamics today. So, you know, I think if we just do the transponder requirement lesson, that'll be a wee bit short on, on on the episode. So we'll get started on fundamentals of aerodynamics. And that first lesson is forces of flight. So that's, it will, we'll get a good tease of what that's all going to be about. Very important subjects there. And, and one that I have a lot of experience in being an aerospace engineer. So hopefully I don't mess it up too bad for you guys because I should know that stuff, but I do. So it's all good. So let's get into lesson 11, the final lesson of the National Airspace System section on transponder requirements. So we mentioned in the equipment required while operating within each specific airspace that there are 
transponder requirement. But there's also some additional requirements for your transponder that go a little bit beyond airspaces and things like that. So that's what we're going to talk about. The FAA requires aircraft to be equipped with an operable mode C transponder and now ADS-B out when in any of the following conditions. Within class A, B, or C airspace, above class B, C, or C airspace until 10,000 feet MSL, within class E airspace at or above 10,000 feet MSL, except in that airspace below 2,500 feet AGL. So we'll, we'll, again, we'll review this in a little bit if you're confused as what the hell that means. Within 30 nautical miles of a Class B airspace primary airport below 10,000 feet MSL, that we call that the Mode C Veil, into, within, or across the U.S. at ease, which is the Air Defense Identification Zone. And then for ADS-B out only, there's a few couple requirements that only correspond to ADSB out. Within Class E airspace over the Gulf of Mexico at and above 3,000 feet MSL, within 12 nautical miles of the U.S. coast, you are required to have ADSB out only, not a operating mode C transponder. If your aircraft is equipped with operational ADSB, then you are required to keep it in transmit mode at all times. So that's anywhere. If you have an ADSB and it's operational, then you are required to keep it in transmit mode at all times. And then finally, for flights above 18,000 feet MSL in Class A airspace, the aircraft is required to be equipped with a 1090-ES ADSB. But below 18,000 feet MSL, the ADSB can either be a 1090-ES or a Universal Access Transceiver or UAT. Okay, so don't worry, we'll review all the required areas that you need to have the transponders and ADSB in a bit. We have a great visual aid that shows visually the airspaces and terrain and, and the ocean, Gulf of Mexico, all that stuff in the online ground school. And it, it, it's a good visual to show you where exactly you, you need that. So we'll, we'll go over that in audio as well. And then I have a video that covers those and I'll put the, the link in the show notes for that. So pilots must ensure that their transponder slash ADSB is operating on the appropriate VFR IFR code as assigned by ATC with altitude reporting enabled when operating in the above areas. So you have to make sure that your transponder slash ADSB is operating on the appropriate VFR IFR code as assigned by ATC with your altitude reporting enabled when you're in those areas. If you think your transponder may be faulty, contact the nearest tower, ATC, or FSS for help troubleshoot. Furthermore, when not operating in an area that requires an encoding altimeter transponder, which is mode C slash S slash ADSB, the transponder should be set to mode A, which is no altitude reporting, unless otherwise advised by ATC. I'm going to repeat that because this is something that could be found on the FA written. When not operating in an area that requires an encoding altimeter transponder, which is mode C, S, or ADSB, so the, the areas that we listed, the transponder should be set to mode A, which is for no altitude reporting, unless otherwise advised by ATC. All right, so the military has multiple kinds of transponders and the military type that corresponds to civilian mode A and civilian mode C is referred to as military mode 3. You may see FAA questions that refer to mode 3 slash A or mode 3 slash C. The 3 is referring to military transponders. So for civilians like us, you just know that this means mode A or mode, mode C. The ident feature on your transponder should only be engaged if you are instructed by ATC to do so. The the same goes for specific squat code. Code 1200 is a standard VFR transponder code and should be used unless you are in an emergency situation or ATC advises you to squawk a specific four-digit code. So basically, use the default 1200 unless there's an emergency or unless ATC has told you to squawk a specific code. And if you want to know more about those codes and how that works, we covered that in how the transponder works in the first section of the online ground school in some of the earlier podcast episodes. So go and check that episode out. It'll be labeled as something with a transponder. So go check that out if you want to learn more 
about those codes and how many codes there are and why why it is the way it is. So, but the ATC is usually going to advise you to squawk a specific code when you contact flight following. When you are leaving airspace, which requires a transponder, and AC, ATC advises that radar service is terminated, that means you can set the code back to the VFR standard code of 1200. So ATC is telling you radar service is terminated. They're no longer tracking you on their radars, so they don't need your specific code to identify you any longer. And you can set that to 1200 now, your code back to 1200, until you contact them again, and then they give you a new code. So that's usually how that works. All right, so the next thing we see here is the, the diagram that I was talking about that shows all the different areas and things of when you need mode C slash ADSB. So we, we again, so I'm just going to kind of review these and kind of point out audibly on this diagram where they are. But again, if you're following along, that's the best way to, to sort of view this. And then I'll put the link in the show notes for you guys. So within class A, B, and C airspace, so we have, again, we have lines of altitude drawn. So we have 18,000 feet MSL, and then we have 10,000 feet MSL drawn on this chart. Then we have obviously the surface, and then we have a da dash line for 2,500 feet AGL. And then we have some terrain, and that 2,500 feet AGL is contoured to the terrain to always be above 2,500 feet above the ground level. So it it changes, right? And there's a there's a part where that 2,500 feet AGL line actually goes above the 10,000 feet MSL line because we have really high terrain in this example. And that can actually occur, and we'll talk about that in one of the requirements. So you, you can actually have, you know, a situation where you're less than 2,500 feet AGL, but you're greater than 10,000 feet MSL if you're flying over a mountain example right so um all right so within class a b and c airspace so class a airspace is above 18,000 feet so above there you need the mode c and adsb 1090 es is required and then we have so 1090 es right we talked about that requirement that's adsb that you need to have when you're above 18,000 feet so that's not for vfr pilots so that's for bigger aircraft jets and things like that you have to have a specific adsb and it's a 1090 es if you're below 18,000 feet you can have 1090 es or the uat all right and then we have some airspace is drawn in blue so we have like a three-dimensional airspace symbol so we have class c and then we have a class Bravo, and we can see that it's required. We show that it's required in class C and class B. And then above class B and class C airspace until 10,000 feet MSL. So we have this line which is drawn until 10,000 feet MSL, and that shows you where the transponder is required. So we have the class C, and then we have like a shaded area above it, which shows you where that transponder is required above it up until 10,000 feet. So same thing for class C and class B. But the class B shaded area is wider than the class B airspace itself because if we go to our requirement within 30 nautical miles of a class B airspace, primary airport, and below 10,000 feet MSL, so you have the primary airport in class B and then 30 nautical mile radius around that. That is called the mode C veil up until 10,000 feet. So that's like a big sort of cylinder that has a 30 nautical mile radius from the surface to 10,000 feet MSL. And that is all, anytime you're in that, you're going to require the transponder. So that's also going to encompass the last one we said, which was above class B until 10,000 feet. So that, this mode C veil that's 30 nautical mile radius up until 10,000 feet, that kind of encompasses everything in class B and above class B to 10,000 feet. So that one can kind of be simplified, right? You just know that, all right, when 30 nautical miles within class B primary airport and up till 10,000 feet, I got to have mode C and ADSB. And then for class C, it's either in it or above it to 10,000 feet. All right. And then we have, let's see here, we have within class E airspace at or above 10,000 feet, except when below 2,500 feet AGL. So we have, again, we have uh, class E airspace, which is, you know, kind of outside of class B and class C airspace. So we have the part where the 2,500 feet AGL line goes above the 10,000 feet MSL line. And this is where the mode C ADSB is not required. So again, within class E airspace at or above 10,000 feet MSL. So we have that listed. So above 10,000 feet MSL in class E, but then we also say, except in that airspace 
below 2,500 feet AGL. So if you're, this is why, why would they do this? Well, if you're at a really high altitude airport and you know, you're working in the pattern, for example. So I don't know how many airports are above 10,000 feet MSL. If, if, if there are any, but if you, if you're working in the pattern on that, you know, and you're not going anywhere else, then they don't need you to require the mode C and ADSB out because you'd be below that 2,500 feet AGL level, but you'd be above the 10,000 feet, possibly in class E. So anyways, that's kind of why, why that is if you were operating out of a really high airport and doing some pattern work or just flying around. All right. And then we have into within or across the U.S. Addies. So we just kind of have a blue line, which is the Addies. And then we show that, you know, it's into within or across that you need those. And then we have the ADSB out specific requirements uh, within class E airspace over the Gulf of Mexico at and above 3000 feet MSL within 12 nautical miles of the U.S. coast. So we have a little line, 12 nautical miles, and we have some water drawn in the Gulf of Mexico and then 3000 feet MSL and above we have listed class E, or sorry, ADSB required. All right, so that is pretty much the diagram right there. Uh, the, the last thing of the requirements is for ADSB that we mentioned earlier. If your aircraft is equipped with operational ASB, then you're required to keep it in transmit mode at all times. So that's just the one other thing to remember that you might get asked about on the FA ratings. So go check out that visual aid. It's going to help you guys a lot. And watch that video that I'll put in the show notes. This is another one where you just kind of have to sort of memorize this stuff. I did mention the stuff that the FA written might ask you about. It's good to know, you know, within class A, B, C airspace, and then above class C airspace, 10,000 feet, and then the mode C veil, 30 nautical mile radius around class Bravo and up to 10,000 feet and encompassing everything in that class Bravo are all required for mode C ADSB. So remember that. Remember the sort of ADSB specific things that I mentioned. If your aircraft's equipped with it, then and it's operational, it's got to be in transmit mode at all times. And then also remember that when not operating in an area that requires mode C, S, or ADSB and that altimeter transponder type, that you should set it to mode A, no altitude reporting unless otherwise advised by ATC. And then finally, when radar service is terminated, you should set your your code back to 1200, your transponder code back to 1200. I think those are the key things to remember here. So go ahead and, and check those out, review those, and we will continue on. This finishes up our section on airspaces and then the transponder requirements as i mentioned before kind of doesn't really have the perfect home but has a lot to do with airspaces so we stuck it in here and now let's move on to section seven so we finished section six so first six sections now finished that is awesome and now we're getting on to the fundamentals of aerodynamics in section seven before we make this complete transition from airspaces and transponders to a total new subject on aerodynamics and forces of flight, I think it's a good place to take a quick break and we'll get started when we get back. I was recently approached to be an affiliate marketer of this company that makes phone cases. At first I was like, eh, but then they told me they wanted to get into aviation and they're going to start making iPad cases because they know how much pilots love iPads. So I thought, okay, I'll check them out. So I took a look and guys, I was actually blown away. I didn't know there was ingenuity like this for phone cases and phone accessories. So everything is like magnetized. So, and it's all thin by the way, because I hate when I have like a bulky bulky case or whatever so you have this case that's got a magnet in it so it's a phone case it's sturdy it's durable it's sturdy it's got a magnet in it and then they sell things like mounts so a little mount that you can put in your car or your aircraft and then the magnet just sticks to the magnet on the mount and then bam and it holds it there perfectly through turbulence and all this stuff and then they also have these really thin mag wallets and i've been looking for a thin wallet forever and same thing it can just stick using the magnet to the back of your phone cases. Now it's like a two in one, but you can also separate them if you don't want it so bulky like me. I feel like this was actually made for me and I didn't know this ingenuity, ingenuity existed in phone cases. So I ordered about six or seven of the things and I'm excited to see what comes next when they get into aviation and iPads. So with all that said, I made sure because I'm always about saving you guys money and only recommending good products, you can get 15% off by using coupon code part-time pilot that's part-time pilot no spaces 
all caps, at scooch.com slash part-time pilot. I'll put that link in the show notes. Right now they're doing a buy one, get one. So go and check them out. Get 15% off. I really, really like Scooch and they have a fun name. So go and check them out and let me know what you think. Hi, this is Bree from Part-Time Pilot. There is no better way to wake up in the morning of a flight than with clear skies and a cup of hot, delicious coffee. And there is no better coffee than coffee straight from Nicaragua. And there is no better coffee for pilots than twin engine coffee. That's why I bought a custom pod for my Keurig and Nespresso machines and a coffee grinder just so that I could grind my own fresh Nicaraguan coffee beans from twin engine coffee. It's so much better than those stupid K-cups or K-pods or whatever you call them. But right now you're probably like, why are you telling us about coffee? Well, it's because not only is it aviation-themed coffee straight from Nicaragua, but it's also coming from a great cause. Rather than taking all of the coffee beans out of Nicaragua to package and sell elsewhere, Twin Engine Coffee is headquartered in Nicaragua, where they have created jobs for local community and have a mission to help reduce local poverty. So if you're a pilot and you like coffee, head over to twinenginecoffee.com slash PTP or with the link in the show notes to order fresh whole bean Nicaraguan coffee straight to your home today. Okay, welcome back. And we are now on section seven, fundamentals of aerodynamics, lesson one, forces of flight. So this is a fun section. I really enjoy learning about how to fly. That's why I became an aerospace engineer and all the dynamics of flight and how it works. So this is a exciting section for myself. Airplanes fly using the combination of four forces of flight, lift, weight, AKA gravity, drag, and thrust. Think of a model airplane and four men, each with one hand on the airplane. Each of the men have the objective to push the aircraft in a certain direction. Man one has his hand on the very top of the airplane and he wants to push down on it, straight down. Man two has his hand on the bottom of it and his objective is to oppose man one and push straight up on it. In this metaphor, man one is the force of the weight of the aircraft or gravity pushing down towards earth. Man two is the force of lift on the aircraft pushing up from the earth. If both men push with the same force, the model airplane will not move in space, right? So if man one and man two are equally as strong and equally pushing the same amount of force, that aircraft is not going to move up and it's not going to move down. It would stay stationary in midair. If man two, who represents lift, pushes with more force or is stronger, the model airplane will rise up because he has more force than the man pushing down who represents gravity or weight. Thus, in order for an aircraft to stay flying in the air, the lift must be equal to or greater than the weight of the aircraft. So that man, man two, who has his hand on the bottom of the aircraft and represents lift, has to either be as strong as man one or stronger for the aircraft to fly. If man one is stronger, the aircraft is going to sink to the ground because the weight is more than the lift. The same analogy can be made for drag and thrust. Let's say there's man three representing drag has his hand on the front of the aircraft and he is pushing the aircraft in the backward direction. Man four representing thrust has his hand on the back of the aircraft and is pushing the aircraft in the forward direction. If they both push with equal force, the aircraft goes nowhere. If man three or who represents drag pushes with greater force, the airplane would go backward. Thus, in order for an aircraft to propel forward through the air, the thrust, which is man four, generated by the propeller, so thrust is generated by the propeller, or in our example, the force is generated by man four pushing, has to be greater than the drag on the aircraft. So man four has to be as strong as or stronger than man three. And if he wants to accelerate, man four has to be stronger than man three, who represents drag. If all men are pushing in their respective directions at the same exact force at the same time, then the aircraft will not go up down, forward, or back. This is akin to the to an aircraft in straight and level unaccelerated flight. In straight and level flight, the lift is equal to weight and the thrust is equal 
to drag. I want to say that one more time because this might be an FA written question. In straight and level flight, lift is equal to weight and thrust is equal to drag. All right, so if you're following along in the online ground school, we have a colorful diagram that shows an aircraft that has the lift pointing up, the, the weight opposing it, the drag pointing backwards, and then the thrust pointing forwards. Next thing I want to talk about is something called the axis of rotation. The combination of the four forces of flight and their relation to one another dictate how the aircraft moves around its different axes of rotation. When the four forces of flight are in complete equilibrium, the aircraft is in straight, level, and unaccelerated flight and not moving about its axis. However, in order to control an airplane to do what we want to, to do as pilots, we have to break this equilibrium to our favor. The three axes of rotation are the longitudinal axis, the lateral axis, and the vertical axis. The longitudinal axis can be thought of as a pole that slices through the fuselage from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. So I like to think when I'm thinking about these axes, I like to think of this aircraft as if it was a marshmallow. So think of an airplane in the shape of a marshmallow and then think of a roasting stick that you could just stick through any direction of the aircraft. So the longitudinal axis would be as if you stuck that roasting stick through the fuselage from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. So all the way through the fuselage. That would be the longitudinal axis. And rotation about the longitudinal axis is called roll. So if you ever played Star Fox on Nintendo 64, which I think is like the best game ever from my childhood, and you remember them saying, do a barrel roll, then you can imagine the aircraft rolling about this axis. So uh, back to the analogy with the roasting stick. So we've stuck that through the nose, all the way out through the tail, through the whole entire fuselage. And now if you take that, the handle of that roasting stick, and you just roll it from right to left with your wrist, right? Twist it from right to left so it, it spins. The aircraft, you know, one wing's going to dip down and the other wing's going to dip up. And then if you roll it back the other way, it's going to do the opposite. That is roll. So one wing following the opposite of the other wing. One wing dips down, the other wing dips up, and then you roll it the other way. You can, if you continue to roll it right, that would be a barrel roll where it's a complete roll. So that's a longitudinal axis and how the aircraft rolls about the longitudinal axis. The lateral axis can be thought of as a pull or your marshmallow skewer that slices through the aircraft from left wing tip to right wing tip. So your marshmallow roasting stick, you stick it through the marshmallow aircraft from one wing, it goes all the way through that wing and then out the other wing. And then now rotation about the lateral axis is going to be pitch. So you can imagine when you, again, you grab the handle of your roasting skewer and you roll your wrists back and forth so it rolls so the the skewer spins the aircraft is going to do almost like front flips and back flips right it's going to pitch up way up and if you keep rolling it you can actually do a front flip or it'll pitch down and you can do a or sorry that would be a back flip and then if you pitch down and you continue to go it would do like a front flip so that is pitch and it is movement or rotation about the lateral axis. And the lateral axis is, again, through the wings. The final axis is the vertical axis, which can be imagined by a pole or your marshmallow skewer slicing straight down through the center of gravity of the aircraft. Rotation about the vertical axis is called yaw. So now imagine our marshmallow aircraft and just you set it down on its wheels and then you take a skewer and you just like stab it straight from the top right in the middle of the fuselage and you stab it straight through the top down through the bottom of the fuselage you know where the landing gear are and then now when you roll this skewer the aircraft is going to yaw to the right or yaw to the left so it's going to be like almost as if the aircraft is spinning like a top right or spinning like yeah a top or a dreidel or whatever right it would just spin along like it's center point or that skewer in the middle when you roll that around that is yaw okay so that those are the general axes of rotation i have a video on this which kind of demonstrates what this looks like and i'll put that in the show notes so please go and check that out it is called the four forces of flight and how they work now the next thing i want to talk about is i want to get a little bit more detail into roll pitch and yaw because those are the the very you know important movements of an aircraft that combined dictate all movements of aircraft so let's talk about those in more detail so first let's talk about roll how does an aircraft roll about the longitudinal axis well an aircraft rolls about the longitudinal axis when the pilot uses the ailerons found on the trailing edge of the wings 
The ailerons work directly opposite of one another such that when the left aileron is deflected up, the right aileron will be deflected down and vice versa. Now, if you're wondering like, what is an aileron? It's the control surfaces at the trailing edge of the wing. So at the end of the wing, if you're looking at the cross section of the, the wing, it's the back of the wing. And it's basically is if you take the back part of the wing, the back part of the airfoil, and you put it on a hinge so that it could tilt down or up. So the back part of the wing on the cross section can tilt down or up. And we did a whole thing on ailerons and control surfaces in our first few episodes. So go back and check out that episode. I'm not sure which episode it is, but go and check that out on primary control surfaces if you want to get an idea of what an aileron is. So when a pilot uses the aileron, turns the yoke to the left or right, one aileron goes up and at the same time, the other one goes down. They're always opposed of each other. So, and then when you turn the yoke the other way, one of them, again, goes from down to up, and then the other one will go from up to down. When an aileron is deflected down, it increases the camber of the wing, which has the effect of an increased angle of attack. So camber is sort of a, a fancy word for like the, the mean shape or the average sort of shape line of the wing relative to, and when that changes to the relative wind, it increases the lift. So it increases the angle of attack and the angle of attack, which we'll get into when we get into our lesson on lift, an increased angle of attack increases lift. So when our aileron deflects down, it increases our camber, which is sort of like the curvature shape of our wing or airfoil. And when that increases, it increases our nominal angle of attack with the relative wind. And that angle, when it increases, increases lift. So, and again, we'll explain how this works in the next section on lifts. So all you need to remember right now is that when the aileron deflects down, there is more lift. On the other hand, when the aileron deflects up, the lift goes up. So when a pilot turns the yoke to the left to enter a left banking turn, what really is happening is that the right wing's ailerons are deflecting down and the left wing wing's ailerons are deflecting up. Since the right wing's ailerons are deflected down, the right wing receives more lift and this raises the right wing. Since the left wing's ailerons are deflected up, the left wing receives less lift. So again, I, I mentioned how it increases the camber when it's deflected down. Well, it does the opposite effect when it's deflected up. It decreases the camber, decreases that angle of attack and actually adds a little bit of drag. So it decreases the lift on that side when it is deflected up. And so when it decreases the lift, that will lower the wing in the air. So remember, we talked about when lift is matching the weight, you get straight and level flight, steady flight. You're not going to go up and down. Remember the men pushing, one man pushing up who is lift and one man pushing down, which is weight or gravity. Well, when we change the, the direction, the deflection of our aileron, we're changing the lift specific to those wings. So when we deflect it up, we've now made the lift less than the weight force on that side. So that wing drops. And then on the other side, we are increasing the lift greater than the weight. So it rises up. So that's why we get the, the rise and fall of the wings, depending on what the ailerons are doing, because we ch we're changing the lift on those wings. So when the pilot turns the yoke to the left to enter a left banking turn, the right wing goes up and the left wing goes down. So I want you to picture this in your head. We can change from our marshmallow aircraft and just think of a little model aircraft. You can use your hand if you want to. I just like to do a like a one of those hang loose signs where your pinky and your thumb is out. And those are the wings of my aircraft. And then if you want, you can, you can stick your middle finger out as well. Uh, just don't do this pointed at anybody, but the middle finger points in the direction of your nose. And so your thumb and your pinky are your wings and the middle finger is your nose. Now, so if we're going to bank to the left, right? That means our left wing goes down. So we turn our hand so that our thumb goes down. I'm using my right hand. So our thumb goes down and our pinky goes up. That's the left wing goes down and the right wing goes up for the left. So let's think about this for the left wing to go down. That means it has less lift. So that means the aileron on that left wing must have went up because when the aileron goes up, that decreases lift. And then on the right wing that went up. So it got more lift. So that must mean the aileron deflected down and it created more lift on that because it increased the angle of attack. And again, we'll get into the details of the angle of attack and the lift equation and all that good stuff. And now this, now if you're doing this with your hand again, you got your, your thumb out, your pinky out, and your middle finger out in your aircraft, right? And you're twisting back and forth, making your, the you know, the both wings or pinky and thumb rise and fall. This is roll. 
we are rolling about the longitudinal axis, that longitudinal axis would be through your middle finger down your forearm, right? And you're just twisting it around that axis, that is roll. And we have a visual of this in a video that I'll, again, I'll put in the show notes. So this lesson has a couple videos, but we also have some images of a roll left and a roll right here in the, the lesson in the online ground school. And then we show what the ailerons are doing in these rolls. So the roll to the right and the roll to the left. So go and check that out if you're following along in the online ground school. Okay, next up we have pitch. How does a pilot make an aircraft pitch? Remember pitch is the rotation about the lateral axis that splits the aircraft from wingtip to wingtip. So that was our skewer through the wing. Wings. And when we roll that skewer, it's either going to do front flips or back flips. The nose is either going to go up or it's going to go down. That is pitch. In order to make an aircraft pitch, the pilot manipulates the amount of lift produced by the tail. So this is sort of the whole point of an aircraft's tail. There's the stability. We want to have stability and we'll get to that. But the tail has control surfaces on the trailing edge of it as well. This is either at an elevator, that's when it's on the trailing edge, or the whole tail can move, and that would be called a stabilator. Now, again, if you're wondering what these are, go to our first podcast episodes on primary control surfaces and go review that so you know what these are and how they work. So again, the same concept now, except that the left and right side work in unison. On the wings, right? the ailerons worked opposite one another. When one went up, the other one went down. They work opposite, but on the tail, it's all just one elevator and they all move at the same. So there's not a left and right elevator, They're, they all move at the same. So when the elevator deflects down, what does that do? Down, it increases the camber of the tail, so we increase the lift on the tail. So imagine, right, someone uh, like a giant coming to an aircraft and grabbing it by the tail and just lifting it up. The angle that, that the aircraft now makes, the fuselage now makes, is going to have the nose pointed down because the tail is now raised up. And it's rotating about that axis if there was, right, so if you had your marshmallow skewer through the wings from one wingtip to the other wingtip, and then you were to grab the tail, this is a better analogy instead of the giant, and you were to grab the tail and just lift it up, the aircraft would spin through the wings around that, the nose would drop down and the tail would point up. That is pitching down, you're pitching down. So when you increase the lift on the tail, that's a pitch down. And what happens during that is your elevator or your stabilator is increasing the angle of attack on the tail. And it, so if it's an elevator, it's deflecting downwards, increasing that angle of attack, increasing the lift on the tail, which causes the tail to rise and causes the aircraft to rotate about that lateral axis through the wings and the nose to point down. So now the opposite happens when the elevator deflects up, right? You get less lift on the tail. So the same thing. Remember the two men battling or women, the two women battling and you got one woman on the top and one woman on the bottom and one is represents weight or gravity and one of them represents lift. So we do that same thing on the tail and if you deflect the elevator upwards, now the woman on top for weight is winning because you're getting less lift than it is weight and that tail is going to drop. So now go back to your, your aircraft on your skewer and instead of, and grab the tail and then instead of lifting it up, push it down and now the nose is gonna rotate up because it's rotating about the wings, about the skewer through the wings, and that nose is going to rotate up. Now that is pitch up. So when what you you as a pilot are doing, when you pull back on the yoke, you are causing the elevator to deflect up, causing less lift on the tail, which causes the tail to drop and the nose to rise. So when you pull back on the yoke, the nose is gonna rise, but what you're actually doing is you're just decreasing the amount of lift on your tail. Now, if you're to push down on the yoke or forward on the yoke, that elevator is going to deflect downwards. You're gonna get more lift on the tail and that tail is gonna rise and your nose is gonna pitch down. So that is pitch and again this is explained in the video in the show notes if you want a visual but we also have a cool visual sort of the pitch axis or the level axis and then we have we show what the elevator or the stabilator is doing and then we show how the aircraft rotates in there and we have some notes too that will be helpful in the online ground school so go and check that out all right and the last rotation i want to talk about is yaw 
How does an aircraft yaw? You guessed it, there is a control surface for that too. This is called the rudder and it's located on the trailing edge of the vertical stabilizer on the tail. The rudder works just like the rudder on a boat. When the rudder is deflected in one direction, it causes the tail of the aircraft or boat to be pushed in the opposite direction. This causes a rotation about the vertical axis located at the center of gravity such that the nose is turned in the same direction as the rudder deflection. An example for pilots is if the pilot were to press the right rudder pedal, in this case the right rudder pedal causes the rudder to deflect to the right, air hits the rudder on the right side of the vertical stabilizer and pushes the tail to the left. Remember Newton says that every action has Isaac Newton, I'm talking about, has an equal and opposite reaction. So when the air is deflected off the rudder, the rudder is also deflected. So a rudder that's deflected in the wind to the right using the right rudder pedal is going to push the tail in the opposite direction. The air hitting that right deflected rudder is going to push the tail in the opposite direction to the left. So the tail is pushed to the left and the nose is then turned to the right because the aircraft is rotating about that vertical axis. So again, that vertical axis was our skewer. They went right through the top of the fuselage and that's where the center of gravity is, the point right on the center of gravity of the aircraft. We stuck our skewer from, from right above it through the center of the fuselage and then out the bottom of the fuselage. And then if we turn that, the nose is going to shift to the right or the left and we can spin it around almost like a top. So when our rudder, and again, it works just like a boat. So if you've ever been in a boat in the back of a boat and you look at the rudder, you can kind of see how when the rudder deflects to the left, then the nose is going to turn to the left or the front of the boat is going to turn to the left because when the rudder deflects to the left, the water is going to hit that rudder on the left side, pushing the tail of the boat, the back of the boat to the right. And I know I should be using like starboard and stern and all that, all those nautical terms, but I don't know. So again, the rudder to the left, water's gonna hit it on that left side, causing the tail to be pushed to the right, and the nose will then follow to the left because it's rotating about that vertical axis. So if you have a marshmallow and you have like a skewer stick and you're struggling with kind of trying to conceptualize this, um, I told you the finger trick, it's kind of, it's easy to do yaw, right? So you have, we have our middle finger out, we have our pinky out, and we have our thumb out. Yaw is kind of hard to explain, but we're just kind of like deflecting our wrist to left and right. Kind of hurts almost, honestly. And then we talked about roll, how that's around the forearm when we just, we roll back and forth. And then pitch would just be, you know, we deflect our wrist up and down. Anyways, what I was saying is if you have a bit, one of those big marshmallows, kind of make little bites in it so that you can at least like make it look like a, almost just like a plus sign or a cross. Now the crossing bar part will be the wings and then the shorter end, pick a side that's, that's the nose and you can make the, you know, the a long one longer than the other. Pick one that's the nose and pick one that's the tail and stick a, a skewer through it and do exactly, and re-listen to this and do it as I'm talking about it. And that's exactly, that's exactly what the aircraft is doing when it's pitch, rolling, and yawing. So it's a cool exercise to do. It's fun and you get to eat a marshmallow. So go check that out. Or you can join the online ground school. <laughs> you can see the visuals that we have in here with actual aircraft and not marshmallows because uh, we have one for yaw and how the rudder is deflecting and all that. And then we also have the videos in here. I will put those video in the show notes though for you guys for free because we're awesome. <laughs> but uh, hopefully you guys, you know, really got something out of this. This is one of the ones that I'm pretty, I feel I'm pretty adequate at explaining using metaphors for the podcast so that you guys can visually, visually see this in your mind. Some of these concepts are, are much harder to do. I'm sure if you've been listening to me this whole time, you you know that like the, the airspace triangle to remember that we just got done with that was kind of hard anyways this was a good one this was a fun one to talk about again I, I like this type of stuff so let's call it quits here i think this is a little bit of a longer episode so that has been lesson one of section seven on forces of flight we finished section six today with the transponder requirements and then we jumped into section seven we started section seven got a good jump on that and then next week we'll probably do lesson two on lift that's a big lesson so we're probably just gonna do keep it at lift because the next left lesson after that is stalls and that's also kind of a big lesson so we'll call it quits there and thank you guys for listening hopefully you enjoyed it learned something safe flight good luck studying and i'll see you guys next week